Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this IT Sussex seminar on uh, battery technology for mobile and clean applications. My name is Mike Underhill. It's my pleasure to introduce it this evening. And uh, let me first of all make one or two uh, announcements. Uh, first of all, the way in which we do questions, the question and answer box. And uh, if you would like to type in your questions, but the questions will be answered at the end of the lecture. So if you like to type in your questions and uh, we will, uh, well, uh, I or my colleague, David James, will actually sort out the questions and um, I group them in some way uh, so that we can ask our speaker to answer them at the end. Next point, I'd like to draw your attention on the slide, which hopefully you're seeing from my, uh, from my screen at the moment. And that is for the upcoming talks. And they're listed there. And I'll just mention the first two of them. The first one is on Tuesday, the 3rd of November, 2020. And it is the science and technology of Antarctica and its impact on uh, climate change. That's going to be given by yours truly, myself. And uh, the next one is on Tuesday, the 17th of November, 2020, at uh, seven o'clock again. And where is blockchain useful? And uh, that is from Adi Ben Ari, and that's from a company called Applied Blockchain. So should know about it. I won't go on to the, the other ones there, um, but they're there for your putting into your diary and checking up on them later. So now I'd like to introduce uh, our speaker tonight. And Sorry, mobile phone went off. I uh, couldn't take it. All right, um, th that is um, uh, our speaker tonight is Julian Dunn, is and he is head of energy at uh, Ricardo Automotive at uh, Leamington Spa in Warwickshire, where he's been for about twenty years, and he has an uh, MEng in electronic engineering from Warwick University. He was actually there as a graduate trainee. And so he was Ricardo sponsored. And there, and then he spent a couple of years in New Zealand as an engineer at a, a company, I think the Design Live Corporation, which is about hybrid yeah, ecological buses. And uh, he uh, then obviously came back to the UK and worked for uh, Ricardo for about 20 years. So with that short introduction, I'd like to hand over to the speaker. So I'm going to, first of all, kill my uh, screen sharing. So a uh, new share, hopefully that'll, oh, wait a minute, that's uh, the wrong thing. Let me get rid of that. Screen sharing, and I want to stop the screening share, which should stop share, which is there, and now, uh, I'll ask Julian to uh, start sharing your screen, please, Julian. Okay, so hopefully that is uh, sharing with everybody. It appears okay here. Okay, perfect. Away you go. Thank you very much, Mike, for the introduction. Um, so tonight I'm just going to take uh, around about 50 minutes to an hour to talk through battery technology for mobility and clean energy. Um, very much a presentation probably of two halves. The first is setting the scene and, and the backdrop to why, why battery technology is important, which uh, sectors it's applied to. And then the second half very much then into exactly what we're doing in battery pack engineering uh, and why that makes a difference. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll start at the very highest level and probably link into Mike's future presentation on climate change in Antarctica, but we'll, we'll make a start. Um, please uh, have some time for questions at the end. So thank you everyone for joining and hope you all find it interesting. So um, as per the introduction, my name is Julian Dern, I'm Head of Energy Storage at Picardo Automotive and Industrial. Um, I'm going to 
probably not linger any more on myself and get, get into uh, the presentation. So what we'll do is um, we'll talk through a brief introduction of just a very brief overview of who Ricardo are. Um, then we'll get into the technology, the trends and drivers for uh, battery technology. We'll start then to talk around cells and battery packs themselves, and then the engineering of those battery packs for, for different applications. So um, Ricardo is a, a global strategic engineering and environmental consultancy. We've been around for about just over 100 years now, founded in 1915 on the south coast by Sir Harry Ricardo. Uh, we specialise in transport, energy, scarce natural resources and waste markets. Um, we, our work is extends across the globe and multi a, a lot of market sectors such as passenger car, commercial vehicles, rail, defence, motorsport, power generation and government advice uh, and certification. Um, so what we do is we apply our deep technical expertise into those fields and, and provide sort of solutions for today and future uh, future problems. So this is a little bit around the, the strategic mission of the, of the business. It's built on kind of three, three pillars here, transport and security, energy, uh, scarce natural resource and waste. Um, you can see on the left-hand side there, some of the drivers, and we'll get into those in a little while. And on the right-hand side there, Ricardo's sort of consulting engineering and product solutions to, uh, to satisfy those, those global needs. So it's probably worth talking a little bit more specifically about um, my part of Ricardo, which is automotive and industrial. So our, our strategy here is to provide clean, efficient and integrated and digital solutions um, uh, propulsion across the energy uh, across sector. Um, what does that, that mean? So let me uh, just bring up a person that will help through the, uh, through the presentation for people. Okay, so we split that down into the sort of energy vectors that you have here. So the ele electric, hydrogen, fossil fuels and renewable fuels and how they transition as a vector through to propulsion systems. And what we're going to talk to today is about battery packs and modules and how they fit. Um, apply to fuel cell a little bit as well and some hybrid systems, but predominantly um, uh, battery systems. So that's the technology and our, our strategic mission. Uh, the company itself, uh, we're about 3,000 staff in total across 20 companies, uh, predominantly engineers, scientists, economics, uh, uh, economists. Um, the main technical centre in the UK are in Cambridge. Uh, and we have some overseas. Blue highlights here are for the main technical centres that we have. Okay, so that was a uh, quick introduction to Ricardo, and now let's uh, talk about the uh, main trends and drivers for. Uh, so, uh, at the very highest level, uh, we see this mega trend that are taking well, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. I think that's true as today as it was, uh, you know, last year and the year before. The uh, large number of options. Some facts here that uh, some hard facts that most people will be pretty familiar with. So population growth for sure. You know, there's different lines on here, but we're seven billion and we're heading towards nine billion on almost certainly by 2050. Um, Urbanisation, I think. The, the previous forecast was 66% of the population will be in an urban environment in mega cities by 2030. I think probably recent events might might cause a slight uh, alter on that trajectory. But what we do see is some in the uh, emerging areas of the world, some cities becoming very, very big. So cities of more than 100 million people in and the challenge around uh, operating uh, city uh, with that level of population, it is incredibly hard. So what we call the rise of the mega cities and the urban mobility and overcrowding challenges, uh, everything that comes with that. 
um, increasing wealth so that the growth of what was termed the middle class by 2030s we're seeing that uh, growing expanding rapidly into China and India and the new consumer behavior that was expected to follow through that so um, the access to education healthier but older you know, demand for solutions um, and uh, increase in energy consumption as well um, that, that will drive that uh, connectivity, <clears throat> I won't talk so much about that um, in detail here, but everything we, our world is getting ever, ever more connected. Everything that we do is typically connected and um, vehicles and transportation, mobility and uh, energy solutions are no different. So prospect of cyber attack, uh, digital resilience is, is important uh, and the way that we connect these systems together as well to make sure that we have uh, an integrated and efficient solution is, is important. Uh, environmental awareness, we'll, we'll talk a lot about this uh, in the coming slide. So that's around the air quality, um, climate change resources. That, that's driven in a couple of different directions. Um, at a, we'll talk about kind of the, the global drive for CO2, the local drive for air quality in cities, um, how you use resources, um, and the full impact of what you do, not just the uh, in-use behaviour of, of products. Um, Anti-consumerism, there's a question mark there. It's a very interesting direction that we, we could set off in or, or, or not. Um, so this is the focus on sharing and experience-based uh, economies where we don't buy things anymore, we share. Um, and that, that has an interesting connotations around mobility where shared services, um, evolutions of things like Uber into uh, more integrated and smart uh, shared, uh, shared society. Okay, so we get to the, uh, <laughs> move into one of those in a little bit more detail. So taking some information here from the World Economic Forum, I think this is going to be a, a great surprise, but it, it does lead us the 10 biggest risk factors and also others around here man-made environmental damage um, and loss of uh, biodiversity so lots of these are can be related to what we're going to talk about in the coming slides and I think the uh, the key takeaway from one of these reports is a tagline of all these risks it is in relation to the environment that the world is was clearly sleepwalking into a catastrophe. So you know, there's different views on this, um, but for sure there is a huge, huge level of concern that if we continue as we are, then we will face um, significant challenges uh, ahead of us. So on the right-hand side here, this, this gives away my age a little bit. <laughs> so this is my life, lifetime here on the right-hand side. This is the uh, average mean temperature globally. And as we all know, that's been on a steady increase um, really since the, the, the late 70s, uh, early 80s. The other, the other plot underneath here is the atmospheric concentration over the last 800,000 years. So natural cycling is, uh, cycling is natural. You know, we've seen increases, we've seen decreases, but what we haven't seen before is the rate of increase. Um, and now we're heading, we're, we were heading towards 400, we're now north of 400, heading above 410. Uh, parts per million and probably maybe even a little bit above that. So that's that sets the backdrop of why uh, why we need to change uh, our current be behaviours, technology solutions, and, and, and the way we. Uh... Uh, Julian, this is Mike Underhill. Can you hear me? Eh? Yes, I can hear you, Mike. Yes, uh, your uh, sound is occasionally uh, cho chopping out. So would it be possible for you to switch off your video? and then switch it on again uh, later at the end. But could you yeah, not, just not operate on the slide? That's excellent. Right, away you go. Not a problem. Thank you, Mike. Okay. So, ho so hopefully everybody's um, still with me and, and following. So yeah, so in terms of CO2 and um, greenhouse, greenhouse gas warming potential, you know, what can we do in clean energy and mobility? So here is a, a global view of where the uh, CO2 uh, carbon dioxide emissions by sector, yeah, energy production is, is significant and these are 2010 figures, energy demand has gone up, um, 
transportation has another chunk. And I think the important part is if we just address uh, transportation with, a, with battery electric vehicles, then that's going to have a big impact on energy. Um, it's also going to have a, a big impact on some of the agriculture, land use and uh, mining activities. So we need to be careful that we don't just uh, address some of these in isolation and we take a holistic approach uh, using what we would call life cycle analysis. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit um, later on. So on the right hand side here, some of the um, pathways that um, again we've looked, have been looked at. So what we're, what we're globally aiming for are these two, one and a half and two degrees uh, temperature rise above pre-industrial um, levels. What we do have is uh, um, we're currently on a trajectory that's somewhere in the this yellow to green line on current policy. Um, if we can make good on the pledges we've made, then we start to see a leveling off. But, but there's a significant challenge around, uh, around the reality of reducing uh, CO2 emissions. So um, at Ricardo, we have a, uh, a part of the business which is they do a thing called scenario planning. So they take the, the state of the uh, world as it is today um, and imagine some future scenarios. So this is just a short exercise that they did for uh, some work in Colorado, just to, just to map that out. This was done in 2019, so it's quite a good test of um, the methodology, given the year that we've just, uh, we're coming through and experiencing at the moment. So, what we do is we've taken one scenario here of what a future world may look like, and this is what we call um, creative scavengers. So this is where we see pretty poor and depressed uh, GDP growth uh, globally. We see sort of fragmentation in legislation uh, globally around climate change, um, which will cascade down into auto manufacturers and mobility. Um, and people competing really hard for, uh, for resources. Um, the the techno, technopolis sorry, um, is, is where we see a very large private uh, development in technology. We start to see a little bit more unified legislation um, and we see a big development into technology. But, um, but it's not all uh, from an ecological point of view. Uh, Digitopolis is where we move very much to a shared digital world um, where things like commuting, uh, transportation become less important, uh, people exist more in an experience based economy. Uh, and then on the right hand side at the bottom here we have Eco Ecopolis, which is more of a following a Green Deal unified policy around climate change um, and living in that future world. So. All of those imagined scenarios for the future, but I think what they do do is give uh, a good test case for the technology that's developed and how it might uh, evolve in those scenarios. And obviously, different people will have an aspiration to live in a, a different future world. Um, I thought that was quite quite a nice uh, way to frame some of the other uh, socio-economic or pestle factors that, that influence the technology that we. we do. So this is some work from the uh, European Union. So this is where we have uh, megatons around. We can see a, a huge reduction in CO2. How we get there is a challenge. And then this put this place on the right. It is an even bigger challenge to get to um, <coughs> where, we, where we need to be. So, you know, there's some key takeaways here that energy efficiency is going to be key, uh, reduction in the total energy demand. So, uh, ride sharing, as an example. So, we're not carrying uh, empty vehicles, empty buses, empty trains. So, you know, we're, we're maximizing the usage through there and the efficiency of those. The fuels that we use to uh, propel those, whether that's electricity, hydrogen, or biofuels, whatever the, the nature will be, and you know, the feeling that there'll be a mix of those in the future, the carbon intensity of those has to be at as low as possible. Um, 
and then the way in which we control these systems is, is really important. I think it's probably worth just uh, reflecting on a couple of numbers. This is sort of a legislation uh, view, but the, the targets for 2030 um, in 2011, we were talking about a four, about a 40% reduction in the CO2, uh, the 1990s, uh, the CO2 emissions from a 1990 uh, level by 2030. That's last year was down to about 50% uh, reduction in 90, uh, by 2030. And now we're looking at probably a 60% reduction in uh, the CO2 levels compared to 1990. So, <laughs> Legislation is there, it's continuing to evolve and it's continuing to get stricter. Um, and what we see uh, as we move through here, we'll, we'll just see um, some life cycle analysis work we've done on transportation. So this is taking the carbon and put the carbon by to manufacture that. Uh, Julian, it's Mike Underhill again. Yes. Can you hear me? Um, the, 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 there's still dropouts on uh, happening. So could, could you try and project a little bit more in, into the microphone or get a bit closer to yeah, it? Yeah, not a problem. I'll sit a yeah. little bit closer. It, it, it's when, when your voice drops, the whole thing drops out completely. So if you could do that. Thanks very much. Over okay, to you. Okay, no problem. Right, let me sit a little bit further forward and hopefully that's a bit clearer. I'll project a bit more as well. Um, so what we have here is some life cycle analysis, as I say, which takes into account the uh, embedded carbon in the production of, production and mining of the materials, the in-use uh, behaviour of the vehicle, and then the disposal of the vehicle. So on the right-hand side here, we can see uh, a 2020 scenario for a vehicle and a 2050 scenario. And where we have ICEV, that's internal combustion engine vehicle, that's gasoline for, uh, and D for diesel, uh, LPG, CNG, uh, a hybrid, hybrid electric gasoline diesel, and a plug-in hybrid electric uh, gasoline and diesel. With a full battery electric vehicle and a fuel cell electric vehicle, there's some uh, assumptions at the bottom here. But I th and at the bottom, we have the production, which is the dark blue, so the amount of CO2 that is produced in the or, uh, green, Global, warm, sorry, global warming potential CO2 equivalent uh, in the production phase, in the use phase, um, in producing the fuel, and then in the uh, usage of that vehicle. So what we can see, there's a broad spread. Um, there's a big reduction going from 2020 to 2050 uh, across all of those. But what we do see unequivocally is that the battery electric vehicle has the lowest impact of, of all the different uh, types of vehicles. So it's by no means there's not zero impact, but if we're looking for the smallest impact, then the current uh, analysis is showing that that has uh, the smallest impact. And that's a weighted average uh, of the EU 28 uh, countries fuel mix for electricity. So. It does vary in different countries. So um, countries that have a very high carbon intensity in the uh, grid mix will be worse. Uh, those that have a lower mix will be, will be significantly uh, better. Uh, so that's the, um, uh, the high level uh, life cycle impact. And we don't currently see that legislated life cycle impact for, for transportation. Um, probably post 2025, 2030. There are other uh, local uh, legislation. So um, across the top, familiar with the diesel gate, uh, Paris Climate Agreement, and then the, some other emission, emission scandals across different uh, areas. The other big drivers are cities. So historically, we've seen government legislate, government and region legislating on CO2, but now we're seeing um, internal combustion engine bans in cities, uh, driving a lot of behavior for OEMs and the products that they, they do develop. So this is the, the, the legislation as we see it for uh, CO2. Um, we've normalized it across a number of different regions. Clearly the trend is downward. Um, there's some speculation as to exactly how low it will go, for example, in the EU by 2030, maybe six, six 
and 60 grams of uh, CO2. What we do see is this um, slight kick up here as we've changed the uh, legislation from uh, NEDC, a test cycle to a more representative one. And what we've actually seen as well is the types of products that have been sold are, uh, have been decreasing their CO2 footprint historically, but as consumers have moved to gas away from diesel and towards gasoline and away from cars and towards SUV and crossover, we've seen an increase in the CO2 uh, production uh, from, from personal transportation. What, what does that all mean? Well, today, this is a, a scenario. Um, so today we're heavily ICE, so internal combustion engine dominant. In the future, we're likely to see a, a large percentage of battery electric vehicles and also a very uh, large percentage of what we call mild hybrid, so 48 volts. Um, Plug-in hybrid is an interesting um, uh, technology. Is it going to be a gateway to battery electric vehicle and quickly disappear? Or is it going to maintain as a very useful uh, product for people that want to commute on electric, um, charge up at work and drive home, uh, so they're tailpipe free for their commute and then at the weekend or for holiday they want to go and drive uh, to France or up to Scotland or wherever they may want to go. Um, the, the key flip, um, transition between the two is, is likely to be the cost uh, and the speed of charging for battery electric in, in the short term. Um, and we'll get into that in, in, in a little bit now. So what we see here on the left hand side is a battery cost estimate uh, and decrease in battery here as we go through. So there's a few different examples here. There's, a, there's an estimate in here, there's some from our customers or some supplier data points. What we look at with keen interest is the point at which the vehicle hits And that's, you can see it, the numbers down here by 2030 with uh, the projected figures. We think we might hit cost parity with an IC. I think that's at the production of the vehicle level. At the total cost of ownership for an end user, we're already seeing that battery electric vehicles are, are cheaper to own and operate than um, combustion engines for some people. Now, the, uh, that will change possibly as taxation on fuel and electricity may or may not change. Who knows where that, that will go in the future, but currently it can, it's very, uh, advantageous to run battery electric vehicles from a cost point of view. What we see because of the uh, reduction in cost of tax is we're seeing the quite we're seeing the range of vehicles go up, going up uh, quite significantly, and more ve a lot more vehicles. The line here around 400 kilometres of range feels like the comfort factor people, maybe it's 500, maybe it's 400, somewhere in that region, a conventional vehicle into a battery electric vehicle. Um, what we're seeing on the right hand side here is a big increase in range within the same product, so that's the same size of battery pack, but getting significantly more range, and that's uh, predominantly uh, driven by the advancements in the cell chemistry for uh, the lithium ion cells, which we'll uh, talk about in a, a little while. So here we there are an awful lot of um, predictions on vehicles. Um, some more aggressive than others, for sure. There's going to be and I think people like the care of their vehicles by 2025. Some people are being more aggressive. And we're seeing the ban on ICE sales circa 2030 and beyond, but as early as 2025 for some of the early adopters. Um, I think what, what is interesting and a dynamic that we're seeing at the moment is, although uh, car sales are slightly suppressed, electric car sales are not. Um, so the market share is growing significantly, even if the total vehicle fleet 
size is, is shrinking. Electric car sales are not seeing the sort of decline that we're seeing in gasoline and diesel at the moment, but obviously in very, uh, very different um, market conditions at the moment. So that, that leads us into, okay, what does that mean at a battery pack level and what, what we're engineering? So I'll take through first uh, introduction to cells and battery packs, and then we'll talk a little bit. So if we talk about the cell enclosure to start with, um, there are three formats that are what we call standard formats. So on the left-hand side, this pink cells are what we call cylindrical cells. Middle cell is here is what we would call a prism cell, and on the right hand side is a pouch cell. So the left hand side um, cells are very small, they're probably about the size of your index finger. Prismatic standard format, and they're probably a little bit uh, I can think of an analogy of what, what size they are, but size of an A5 notepad. And on the right hand side, then the pouch, which looks a little bit like a boil in the bag curry with some electrical tabs on the top in all different sort of shapes and sizes with tabs on the top and on the side. Um, the um, pouch, uh, sorry, the cylindrical and prismatic cells have a solid uh, enclosure, so they have an aluminium or steel enclosure, um, whereas the pouch is a soft, if you squeeze it, you can feel the uh, um, active material inside uh, compressing slightly, and it does over time swell. So anyone who's had a uh, a mobile phone that's a few years old and it starts getting very hot. If you if it's got a removable battery, you take it out, you will see that the uh, battery has started to swell and that's a degradation in the battery. So uh, there's a, quite a simple anecdotal test for your mobile phone battery. If you take it out, put it on a flat surface and if it spins on its center, then you know that your battery degraded because it's uh, swollen uh, in the center here. So, uh, within the battery, within the cell itself, they all have the same um, components within them and the same makeup. So they're made of a cathode material, a separator, an anode material, uh, the electric. Um, so we have the, the, the cathode material uh, and the anode material, which is then separated by, by the separator in the middle here. Uh, you can see ions pass through that separator from one side to the other uh, while the electrons travel around uh, around the rest of the circuit through the uh, electric motor or the, or the load and back back through um, and these are just so for a cylindrical cell it is rolled up the anode cathode and separator is rolled into a coil and joined with a small tab at the top to uh, the top of the can the uh, pris prismatic cell is uh, similar to cylindrical, it's uh, wound up a little bit and then uh, pressed into a, uh, a form and the pouch is uh, stacked, lots of layers stacked together and then wound, wound up. So, so those are the sort of conventional uh, cell formats. If we move into a battery pack, so for a typical, oh, this is what the battery pack looks like, um, as a step. Um, so these are the cells in here, and what they are, they're built into what we call a module, um, which builds a number of cells together and then is assembled. In front of the battery pack, here we have the external connections. So for this example, it's a cool battery pack, so you have the coolant flowing out. Um, the uh, charge port for the, uh, the plug-in charger, the high voltage connection, and the low voltage connection for um, all wheel drive vehicles. You can sometimes have a connection at the back as well. But then you have a top enclosure which, which covers all of the thin seals around the side and contains um, in stops water, dusting grass. Uh, what we have on on the battery pack then are venting holes. So uh, we'll talk about this. Failure modes of a lithium ion cell is that it can go into, it'll get very hot um, fire and then it will you need to then exit that from the battery pack. And the top of the battery pack 
typically inaccessible from the inside of the car. We have, we have a manual safety disconnect or a, a disconnect. So you take, take this out from the car, then the out to the rest of the rest. Here we have what's called the uh, or the battery management system on top. Uh, the voltage, the current, um, and the state of health of the, the battery pack. Once we have the junction box, which is a sort of switch gear, there's a fusing, contact us to turn on. And then we have, as I said earlier, the modules here, and they have what we call a CSC board, which talks to the um, Uh, we used to see smaller modules of about 12 cells. Now there's a move towards larger, 24 or, or more cells in a module. Um, uh, all of this battery packed then for this example sits on the coal plate um, and water glycol through and you Charging or when it's uh, here, which is often a structural piece of uh, ash, there'll be some structural so that's the, the sort of constituent parts of the battery pack. Um, Talk about just very briefly is the the chemical mix that you can have within each cell is is different. So on the left hand side here we've got a a increase. Um, up the side we have the specific energy density, and on the bottom we have power. So typically power gives you acceleration or fast charging speed, uh, and energy gives you rate. So very good um, energy dense by. Uh, um, but some so lithium sulfur, for example, looks really good, but it is not very dense from a volume perspective. So it takes up a huge amount of space. That's something that might apply to um, buses or trucks or something like that in the future. Most chemistries that are used in uh, battery electric vehicles are NCA and NMC. The, these chemistries around here, um, they're continually evolving and moving, moving up in this direction uh, towards where we see uh, NMC 2020 to be on might be creeping a bit beyond that but it's the industrialization of these uh, new chemistries that is particularly uh, challenging. So choosing the right cell chemistry for an application it is important so as we say NCA is something that Tesla use, uh, NMC is used by a lot of other Automotives like um, B, for example, characteristics not just stuff, but their life cycle life vehicle safety and costs. So some of the high um, power cells don't perform so well from a from a safety perspective. What we are seeing is uh, LFP on the right hand side, which typically hasn't been quite so energy dense, um, but is a safe and cobalt free um, chemistry that's typically been used in stationary energy storage. But we can see in China, it's, it's been very favoured by the government uh, and lots of um, domestic manufacturers. And it's actually moved, made, finding its way into the Shanghai built Tesla Model 3 and uh, Model Y. So not as energy dense, but has some other characteristics. It's cheaper. Um, it has good power rating. So it is a good, it will become a good option for um, more battery electric cars. On the right hand side here, we've got some plots. So this is the uh, open circuit voltage drop uh, with capacity for different chemistries. And for most of them, you see what is actually relatively flat um, discharge line, which is good from a system architecture point of view. You have a nice stable voltage for electrical uh, inverted power electronics uh, and machines through here. What you see particularly with <coughs> lithium ion phosphates of LFP 
it is very flat and a big hysteresis. So although that's great for uh, voltage stability in your application, it's a big challenge to know where you are in terms of your state of health, uh, state of charge. So you can't directly read across um, in terms from voltage to state of charge, and that can be a bit of a challenge for the battery management system. Whereas others, you can not only count the uh, Coulomb count, but you can also read across uh, to check correctly your state of charge. At the bottom here, we've got the energy released by uh, different chemistries. So uh, uh, at LCO, you can see that's a very low, um, low energy release. You've got to be very careful that you keep your battery system nice and low. If it does get hot, then it requires less energy to propagate that uh, heat through and release into subsequent cells, but it's very good for power. What you can see uh, from LFP on the right-hand side, again, very stable at the far right-hand side in terms of the chemistry and the, in the middle then the um, NCM, NCA chemistry sort of typically about 150 degrees. Okay, so a question we often get asked is, are we gonna run out of lithium? Are we gonna run out of nickel? Are we... So I think, there's typically about 2% of that is lithium, is lithium, so it's relatively low. It's pretty abundant lithium. Um, I think more important than the question, of are we going to run out, is how do we extract the best level of lithium? Um, and part of the answer to that is recycling the lithium that's in uh, battery packs, but also making sure that the way in which we extract fresh lithium or raw lithium is, is um, environmentally sensitive to, to the way that we do it. Okay, yeah, so here, for example, uh, for a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack, there's only about 11 kilograms of uh, lithium in the, in the battery pack. And 100 kilowatts is, uh, hours is about the biggest pack that a uh, Tesla uh, cell at the moment. It's slightly bigger than uh, an iPACE battery pack, Porsche Taycan, that that sort of size was at the bigger end. Uh, we expect to see probably about 50 to 60 kilowatt hours uh, as a convergence point, probably mean, or 50 to 70 as a convergence point for, for battery electric cars. Uh, um, Julian, can I interrupt again, please? Yes, yes, for sure. Uh, right, there's still audio problems and there's been a very, very good, useful suggestion. At the moment, your fan noise is uh, being treated as background noise and so is also the pauses between your your speech. So is it possible just to take a minute or so to disable the suppress background noise uh, in the in the zoom? Can you can you have you seen that setting in the zoom audio? Uh, uh, Asim, what I'll do is I'll move to my um, headset. And let me do that. And that will hopefully um, make an improvement. So has that improved things? Well, uh, the, the audio level is much lower at the moment, uh, but apart from that, I can't say whether there's okay. any uh, dropping out. So could you, can you wi uh, wind up the audio level a bit? I can try, let me just, just give me a second. Um... Not, nothing you heard at the moment. Yeah, sorry, that was me but beavering away. So how is that for audio level now? Oh, that's that's considerably better. So okay. uh, I, I think that should uh, uh, hopefully improve things. So please carry on. Okay, and the, no uh, problem. No problem. Um, the inter the, you know, people are, are saying it's an interesting talk, but the dropouts are, are, are getting difficult. But carry on. Away you go. Okay, let's, let's carry on then. Okay, so um, cobalt is a challenge in, in battery packs. So uh, I think 85 to 90 percent of the, the world's cobalt is mined out of the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and refined in China. That brings with it all sorts of um, sustainability challenges. Um, so there's, there is a move to try and both uh, improve the sustainability and the um, ethics around some of that mining. Um, 
and also redu reduce the amount of cobalt in, in the battery pack. So I guess, what does cobalt do in a battery pack? It, it increases in a cell, it increases the stability of the chemical compound in the cell, which means it's more temperature tolerant and more power, uh, more tolerant a number of cycles. So as an example here, we can see this is the retained capacity on the left hand side. Um, and this is what we call an NMC. So this has 60% uh, nickel, 20% uh, manganese and 20% cobalt. Here's a 811, which is 80% nickel, 10 manganese and 10 cobalt. So we've just taken a 10% uh, half the amount of cobalt in the cell. But over time, you can see this cell degrades to 92%, give or take. Here, with a reduction in cobalt, you, you reduce the number uh, down to well below 75, just after 600 cycles. So reducing cobalt is a, a great aspiration, but it doesn't come without challenge. Um, the other thing to bear in mind when reducing cobalt is that the um, move towards faster and faster charging increases the temperature of the battery pack quite significantly. Um, and cobalt has the advantage of st stabilizing the chemistry within the cell uh, for temperature. So yeah, a lot of work that's going on, but uh, yeah, not without challenge to reduce uh, cobalt from, from the battery pack. And that's to say, I think, yes, there are challenges around cobalt, but that's not to say ev every piece of cobalt is, is, is problematic. There are some of it which is extracted in a, in a way in line with other raw material extraction and it's probably also worth saying that it's not just the uh, electric car industry that has to solve this it's a consumer electronics and lots of other industries as well that need to uh, address this so one of the big um, solution pieces for battery electric vehicles is getting the recycling so there's a raw, the mining and the raw extraction feeding that into um, the manufacturing process, the battery in use, uh, potentially second use, and then some of that will go into landfill, some of that com comes back round. Um, one of the interesting things I think for uh, battery electrics is that the nickel and manganese that comes back around this process is of higher grade than the, the raw material that's mined, so you, it is at, does actually have higher value um, than some of the raw materials in some cases. So slightly conscious of time and we're still uh, still on the first uh, section. So what we do here, just looking at the degradation for lithium ion cells, so, so what happened? So there's lots of causes on the left-hand side, so time, so they, uh, uh, they age with time, so what's called calendar aging. Um, high temperature causes uh, aging low temperature <laughs> causes aging, high voltage or high state of charge. So if you keep them 100% charged, that, that causes aging. The load current, so the speed at which you put uh, current in and out of the cell causes aging and mechanical stress and being uh, left at a low state of charge. So there's there's lots of things to take care of on a, on a lithium ion cell. People often say they're a little bit like a human being that, um, they like to be just about the right temperature, sort of 25 degrees is quite pleasant. If it gets above sort of 40, they start to get a bit, a bit hot and sweaty and below sort of five or zero, they start to get a bit cold. Um, you ask them to do a little bit of work, they're quite happy. You ask them to do a lot of work, they start to get a bit, uh, a bit stressed. So <laughs> it works quite well as an, an analogy uh, with humans. And I guess I, I won't go through the degradation mechanisms and modes, but the effect is either a capacity or a power fade on on the cell itself. So um, that, that's a reduced range uh, of the vehicle and that's a reduced charging speed or acceleration. Uh, so um, I'll spend the last, last section of the talk now um, just going through what that means when we try and engineer, uh, engineer battery packs for some applications and some of the work that we're doing and, what, and why we're doing it. Uh, so there's the, we've talked about the, some of the influences on vehicle requirements, drivers and enablers, um, a lot around environmental, a little bit on safety. Uh, I won't perhaps go through these again in great detail, but what we're seeing on infrastructure is the charging speed um, 
is pushing you know, uh, 250 kilowatts, 350 kilowatts is a huge amount of power to um, deliver into a battery pack, but that's where the current fastest chargers are, are operating at. Uh, and we see that only increasing. I think probably what's worth mentioning here is the one megawatt and beyond is probably different different uh, applications from a passenger car. That might be a truck or uh, marine applications, aerospace applications, but nonetheless, a, a huge amount of power uh, to deliver. So, so this, this is an introduction to some of the uh, technology solutions that, that we work on to try and address these challenges. So at the top left, the thermal management of the battery pack is absolutely key. So when you have the high power ultra fast charging, you reject a lot of heat. It can be when you're charging at 250 kilowatts, you can be rejecting 20 or more kilowatts in, of heat in, uh, from the cells in bus bars in the battery pack. And you have to deal with that somehow. So um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the solutions for that. Um, digital engineering. So we talked about the cost um, of battery electric vehicles, reducing the cost um, of those is significant is uh, an important step. So going after after that is important, doing things in a digital environment that then uh, means when you come to test, you have to uh, put less samples through abusive tests, which are expensive uh, and take a long time. We talk about cell to pack. So that's rather than using modules, we go straight from cells and we, we, we fill up a pack with uh, cells um, and advanced battery management system. So that's taking the battery management system and not just pushing data from the vehicle into the battery management system, but looking at a fleet and cloud uh, data that comes to the vehicle battery management system and using uh, machine learning techniques for that. Um, I'm going to skip through a couple of slides now just to talk, um, give ourselves a bit of time to talk about. Um, so the tool, to, so what, how do we um, address all of that complexity about uh, battery, different formats, different cell chemistries, uh, different applications. So we take um, a cell database, so we test lots of cells, we get cell data sheets from suppliers, um, so you understand how a cell will perform. You build a model where you combine the electrical, aging, thermal, and the battery management system of the battery pack. You take the requirements that uh, the application might have, if it's a vehicle, how far it has to travel, the acceleration, the charging speed, and then you generate um, a number of different scenarios for those battery packs automatically. And that will give you a which cell to use, how many of those cells, what electrical configuration you should be using. Um, and that then allows you to look at those configurations and how they will age. So if you start at 100 percent, what the degradation in time is for those different uh, battery packs. And some people might choose a very quick, a very fast degrading battery pack because the cells that you choose are cheap or you use less of them. So the cost of that battery pack is really low uh, compared to a battery pack that ages very slowly, might, might be more expensive in some scenarios. But what, we, what we're what we looking at more and more is not just which is the best performance from a cost uh, dollar, pound, euro perspective, but from a full life cycle analysis. So if you're going to have a battery pack that ages very quickly, does it use less materials? Is it more environmentally sensitive to mine and uh, produce this battery pack and replace it and recycle it than maybe this one at the top? So how, how all of that plays uh, out? I think I won't. I was going to talk in a little bit more detail about how we go through uh, go through these steps, but um, I think for the interests of time tonight, let's. Uh, move through to some of the thermal technology that, that we're working on. So we're working on what's uh, an immersion cooled battery pack. So this is a collaborative program with uh, Warwick University M&I Materials uh, sponsored by uh, Innovate UK. So this uses uh, a dielectric fluid, which is in direct contact with, in this case, cylindrical cells. You can see the cylindrical cells in this small module, uh, the cool and flow in and out. Um, and the idea is by directly contacting the uh, hot surfaces, you can uh, reduce the temperature, the peak temperatures in the battery pack, um, keep a more even 
distribution of temperature amongst the cells and um, therefore improve the life of the battery pack and some safety. So we're part way through this program. Um, I think what's interesting to say, I guess anecdotally, so if you, um, oh, I've got some data actually on, on this, so we'll have a look at that in just a second. So here you can see a little bit more into the battery pack. So with the top cover removed, you can see the cells uh, exposed there. Um, we're using what we call cylindrical 21 700, so they're 20, 21 millimeters in uh, diameter and 700 millimeters tall. Um, 78 cells in the small module, it's about the size of a uh, large shoebox, it's probably you know, give a sense of scale, in about a kilowatt hour for, for this uh, battery pack. So what we found is that um, let's look at let's look at some data, which will be uh, best. so when you use this um, battery pack, we have also built a, a very similar battery pack with the same cells on uh, a coal plate, so uh, aluminium plate with water and glycol that goes through, which is a conventional way of cooling uh, cells at the moment. The coal plate is shown in blue here, so this is the pack temperature across uh, this axis so you can see with a cold plate you see some very high uh, temperatures and a big uh, distribution in temperatures with the immersion you see much much lower peak temperatures and a more even distribution so that has a, a couple of impacts the first is on aging so for this scenario, it extends life by about 8% by keeping the cells at a very similar temperature, and reducing the, the peak temperature. But it also has the, um, if you remember back to the graph of the energy released by temperature, it, in, it gives you a bigger buffer from uh, the flash point of the cell or the thermal runaway of the cell by bringing that, that peak temperature down. Um, it allows you, you to fast charge as well uh, for vehicles. So um, yeah, it's a very promising technology. What we've got here from the, the test data, so we have the cold plate module. So these are, we've done a mini module with uh, seven cells, so the six cells surrounding a central cell uh, with a cold, aluminium, aluminium cold plate on the bottom. Um, this one here is immersed in the you know, dielectric fluid. And what we do is we owe one of the abusive tests that you have to do is overcharge one cell to force it into that heat release point. So in the graph here, you can see this is the cell in the center that we force into, into heat release. And you can see all of the other surrounding cells also follow that into, the, into that heat release profile. So you see that big spike. When you use a dielectric um, fluid here around the cell, Yes, the first one gets to that flat, uh, heat release point, but you see the other cells uh, maintain a much more stable temperature profile uh, and you mitigate the sort of uh, propagation of a potential fire from one cell to the next by using uh, this cooling technique. Um, I think so, and if I just step through, this is um, work that we do on uh, battery management systems. So. They're ever more connected um, to what we call f the, the vehicle fleet and the cloud. So rather than just knowing what the individual vehicle is doing, if an OEM or an operator knows what every single vehicle in its fleet is doing and how the battery is performing, you can do uh, remote prognosis and early diagnosis of failures, whether that's by cell temperature or degradation. And depending on who you are, if you just sell, have an owner operator model, you can bring vehicles in for service before you have a failure. If you operate a fleet, um, you can move which vehicle operates which section of the fleet to try and extend the life of uh, your whole fleet. So that's using a lot of the modeling techniques we've developed around battery pack aging um, and cell chemistry and coupling that together with some large data, some over the air platform and uh, to develop that. The last um, slide then that we I wanted to talk about was what we call cell to pack. So this is where we take the cells and we pack them um, into the battery pack, not in modules. So we put them all together. Uh, that has benefits from an energy density point of, point of view. So we for the project we're looking at here, uh, as an example, Tesla Model 3 and iPACE are quite good examples of uh, energy density for the packs. They're about 150, 170, what we call watt hours per kilogram 
Um, and what we're seeing here is we want to move towards a 185 uh, by going in uh, sell to pack. And it, it's probably worth saying that you might think, well, that's not so much from the, uh, the Tesla uh, value, but this is for a pouch format, which is slightly different. So that gives you some inherent advantage in the, the cell chemistry here um, and reducing the pack. So what, what do we see by uh, going to sell to pack? We've seen a, a significant reduction in the number of connections. So we see a reduced uh, resist, resistance of the pack, um, which increases efficiency, uh, reduces the heat rejection, um, which, which uh, reduces the cooling demand on the battery pack. Here we have an example of what we call a skateboard battery pack. So this is the cell to pack. And in the middle here, we have space for the fusing, uh, switch gear, battery systems and things like that into there. Um, we've also studied, so most battery packs today are at 400. The Porsche Taycan is the first one in the market at 800 volts. Um, we've looked at 1400 volts, which is below the 1500 uh, volt uh, standard. And we see probably about a 5% uh, efficiency improvement of what we call 1C. So that's a 60 kilowatt uh, discharge for, for that battery pack. So not an insignificant energy saving by going up to 1400 volts. Um, what you do need to be careful of at the moment is the supply chain is set up around four and uh, 800 uh, volt battery packs. So there's probably a scarcity of supply in passenger car, but not perhaps in commercial vehicle or off highway. So I think I'll probably draw to a close there. So apologies if uh, the sound quality is uh, support the enjoyment for some people there but hopefully we can go back to some topics now in the Q&A and, and cover anything that was perhaps a little bit difficult to follow earlier so uh, yeah thanks for listening and Mike hopefully that's the audio's improved with the use of a headset. Uh, well yes it has indeed and uh, you know there have been some comments to, to that effect uh, a little bit of a lesson learned uh, um, we, we're quite new to this and Perhaps we should uh, specify headsets should be used or something like that. But um, the general comments are, are, are a very interesting talk. And just in connection with the, the audio, uh, there is particular um, the, the well, it's just come up again as a note. Uh, would you be able to let the slides be available uh, at all for that for for this or would that be possible? Yeah, yeah, we should be able to make the slides available. That's not, yeah, not a problem. Okay, well, we'll we'll contact about that. And we, what we will do is we will put them on the Sussex IET website, and they will be accessed from there. Um, right, there, there, there are one or two questions. Uh, let, oh, there's some more come up, but let's go from the top. And um, the first question is from Adrian Sharman. And what it is, is with the projected shift away from ICE, the governments will lose their tax revenue on petrol stroke diesel. So will this be replaced by increased taxes on electricity? And if so, will that work against the shift to BEV, etc.? What is the solution? Well, what do you think? Um it's a difficult one. We haven't seen that move towards taxation of electricity uh, for mobility. I think it, it is a given that there'd be a big loss in revenue from uh, petrol and diesel sales. Whether we'll move towards a um, road use, it pay as you pay as you use on roads. Um, you know, there's a big move to smart motorways, number plate recognition. So the infrastructure is perhaps there to for people to pay you know, more at a peak time to go into a city and less uh, uh, off peak um, is a potential scenario to recover some of the uh, lost revenue. I think it, it's probably part of the bigger picture of investment in energy generation and security of supply as well. So if we become more independent um, in terms of energy supply, then, then that gives us some more options. But yeah, I, it, it is a difficult one. There's no direction really yet from government in which way they'll go. They will go on this one. But I think in the in the short term, they're, they're looking to incentivize as much as possible to get that that shift away from the, the tailpipe emissions that, that we currently see. Right. 
Okay. Um, now another question. Uh, it's a one from James. And how does the presenter see the lithium ion fire risk? As how has it been managed on premises such as uh, for lithium ion storage as it grows in the form of large bot battery storage? So, so what's the risk of you know of the batteries getting larger and more? Is it more of a fire risk? I think if if we talk about um energy storage, stationary energy storage, um, so big shipping containers full of battery packs. That chemistry tends to be the LFP, um, which has a higher temperature tolerance. It's a more stable chemistry. Um, so, so we're less likely to see uh, problems around that. I think with all technology at scale, there will, you know, there will be individual instances. I think what we perhaps are seeing uh, at the moment in China is where we see eight, some of the more advanced uh, cells coming in that are have perhaps a reduction in cobalt um, and uh, coupled with fast charging they are, they are seeing perhaps a few more fires than they would uh, want to see in vehicles um, so I think it, it is a bit of a challenge there's more legislation coming in around uh, how you test for this so the new legislation is within five minutes of detect it. You have five minutes from detecting that you have a problem with a cell to allow occupants to uh, leave the vehicle. So you give the people a five minute warning to, to exit the vehicle. And that's what battery packs are currently being engineered to meet. Um, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of vehicles in the field. And yes, you, you, if you search on YouTube and Google, you will always see you know battery electric car fires, but they are pretty rare. Um, I think Nissan fairly proudly say they've never had an event with half a million vehicles. So it will always be on this balance of searching for ever increasing energy density versus the stability of that chemistry and um, uh, and the fast charging speeds. Okay, right. The uh, next question is again from Adrian Charman, and uh, he says, uh, "I've." He's always wondered uh, why BVs aren't going to have modular batteries. Well, you did talk a bit about that, but you only then need to fit connect uh, the battery required for your journey. In other words, reduce the weight by only carrying what you need. And uh, the recharge is then just a refuel. Fuel. You go to the battery station and replace the batteries or take out your empty cells, plug in fuel cells. Now, that's a fairly dramatic thing to ask. Yeah. What do you think about that? Um it, pe people have looked at that so i think the modular battery pack is is interesting and you do see um let's say the vw id3 will launch with three different battery sizes so that's that's quite common one thing you need to but that's not swappable in service by, by a user that's fitted when you buy the vehicle and will remain that way until it until it's disposed of um, you need to be mindful of the voltage so you need to be able to maintain 400 volts if you have a smaller battery pack um battery swapping itself people have looked at um so there's a company called better place probably 10 years ago now that was a big advocate of swapping the whole battery pack from your vehicle at a motorway service station giving you a new fully charged battery pack and off you go um it, it never really took off uh, the couple of the main challenges around that is standardization of the vehicle interface so getting all the different OEMs, you know, Ford, Renault, VW, BMW, whoever they may be, to agree to a standard uh, footprint for the battery connection, size, capacity would, would be difficult. And the other challenge is the, the cooling medium. So if you have coolant on the vehicle and then a foreign uh, coolant coming in the battery that you swap in and mixing of that, you, you potentially don't have, uh, that's not a known quantity. So yeah, this, it, it's been looked at, but I think it, there are quite significant challenges around that. And if you go down in mobility size, so to e-scooters um, and rickshaw size, people do have swappable battery packs. So it looks a bit like a, um, a shoe box with a handle on the top. So you pull it, you lift the seat of your scooter, you pull out the battery pack, you put it into a charging station at the side of the street and you take out a new battery pack that's or a fully charged one and you pop it into your scooter and off you go so i think for for those applications where you can handle a 10 or 12 kilogram battery pack it, it makes sense um but 
for you know a car or something it probably doesn't make sense to swap it at, at your home before you go to reduce the weight on your journeys um, yeah the complexity and the, the weight of the battery packs is quite high okay right um we've got a couple of nice comments uh for, for you thank you very much it's uh, really enjoyed it and very um and uh uh, thanks for the presentation. So a couple of people. But before we move on, uh, Julian, could you try putting your camera back on again so yeah. we can see you? Yeah. It'd be nice to see you. Okay. Yeah, I'm still um, here. <laughs> oh, yes. And now you've got your headset on. It's yeah. a marvellous improvement. Uh, may not have improved your image, but never mind. <laughs> uh, right. Um, next question was from Martin uh, L. Is, yes, Martin L. He says, I am an avid caravanner. Two of the key factors, uh, well, the key factors is the weight of ratio between the caravan and the car. The car must be heavier than the caravan. Secondly, the av available torque, that's the second factor. Consequently, diesel cars are favored because they provide good torque and are heavy. Generally, electric motors can offer excellent torque, but I'm unsure if these un advanced battery packs will be heavy like lead acid and another issue is range as towing will no doubt reduce range what's the speak of your general view on towing uh, uh julian yeah so i think the the first generation of electric vehicles didn't allow towing um so the things like the bmw i3 um, the tesla model s it, you couldn't tow with those vehicles um the the few the more recently released ones you can so the tesla model 3 the model y the model x that you can all specify those as towing um what you can so weight is not going to be a problem so typically a battery pack will weigh more than 400 kilos four to 600 kilos would be a battery pack weight so an electric car is typically heavier than its uh, gasoline equivalent so a ID3 would be heavier than a Golf, for example. Um, um, a Tesla Model 3 would be heavier than a, a Ford Focus, something like that. So, so weight ratio wouldn't be a problem. I think the range is the is probably the interesting one. There's been quite a few studies. I think it's you see 15 to 20 percent range degradation when towing with some of the bigger electric vehicles like a Tesla Model X. So, um, you can charge at speeds of you know, nearly a thousand miles per hour is how they have they sort of specified charge speeds now. So, in fifteen to twenty minutes, you can add two more than two hundred two hundred miles of range to your electric car if you have a have one of the more newer models. So, yeah, I think it would be range and efficiency that might be the um, the challenge rather than weight. But it, it depends how far you go, how fast you go, how how often you want to stop. Um, but yeah, anecdotally, I know people that have driven to the south of France in their electric cars and really enjoyed the experience. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, now some more questions. Uh, is is uh, is the focus on fast charging really that important? If most users charge their cars overnight at home or during the day in the the office. Um, <laughs> so personal opinion, no, I don't think so. Um, I guess anecdotally, I, I've got an electric car and I've never charged it anywhere other than at work or at home. Um, that's not to say if I went up to Scotland that I wouldn't want to charge at a service station, but that might be once a year or, or very infrequently. It's seen, but my personal opinion is that it's seen as the key metric to move people from a, a petrol or a diesel vehicle into an electric car. They want to see the range and they want to see a charge speed often once people have bought an electric car they don't really worry about the fast charge speed as long as it's reasonably quick they're not worried about very very fast charges they're worried about efficiency and lots of other factors so it's a strange one because it's needed to get people to adopt the technology but once they've adopted the technology it may not be such a requirement for, for the vast majority of people okay they don't use it then exactly and, yeah <laughs> i think you need it but you don't use it yeah right. um that answers a question from alan not which was uh, does julian drive a bv and if 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 not why not but you've answered that one so i'm going to move on to a couple of uh, i suppose they're chemistry questions and i'll group them together from r1 
the first question is, is LIFE PO4, the lithium ferrous, uh, blah, 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 yeah. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Chemistry yeah, is phosphate, I think. Yeah, phosphate. LFP, yes, right. I couldn't think of the word. Right. Is that is it supposed to be safer than other lithium chemistries, and does this reduce significantly the complexity, size, cost of the control circuitry? Well, that's the first question. I don't know if you want to couple it to the to the next one. If I can just uh, okay. operate the machinery here and get the next one up. Um, the uh, Oh dear. Oh yes, it was uh, a question which came up uh, on the uh, on the chat rather than the Q and A. What about lithium titanate titanate oxide? Yeah. Okay, those are the two questions. Okay, right. So we're kind of, let's start with LFP first. Um, LFP is a relatively cheaper uh, chemistry. It is safer inverted commas from uh, more temperature tolerant chemistry we it doesn't have the energy density typically of the the more advanced nmc chemistry so you most manufacturers perceive it not to give a vehicle the range that they would desire um, for example the tesla model 3 this with a 75 kilowatt hour battery pack probably only fits about 50 55 kilowatt hours of lfp battery pack but that might be enough for some people, uh, you know, a sort of more than 200 mile range rather than 300 mile range. So historically, it's it's been perceived to be not quite energy dense enough to give people the range, but it's improving all the time. It's used quite often in stationary energy storage. Um, so it does, yeah, it can uh, simplify the control system, some of the mitigation and design uh, solutions that you need to put in place to, to manage uh, thermal runaway but you still have to manage that even if it is it's a less uh, less likely event um, lithium uh, titanate oxide yes very high power uh, not very um, energy dense uh, chemistry and quite a volatile uh, chemistry as well so it's used in very high power applications but not really so much in um, mobility okay um moving on the questions are coming in thick and fast but so uh, we'll uh try and keep the, up yeah. yes the trend towards bigger battery this is from richard broughton uh the trend towards uh, bigger battery capacities of vvs means lugging around a lot of extra weight and higher co2 in manufacture uh for them uh, just for infrequent long journeys, do you have views on a sensible battery size and are PHEVs a good option because of this? Um, so battery size, I think I mentioned, but maybe it co co uh, got cut out. I think we'll, we'll, we'll sort of centre on perhaps a 60 kilowatt hour battery pack um, as a as the average battery pack size coupled with pretty good fast charging and that will give most of the people most of the uses that they need from their vehicle um uh sorry what was the second part to the question is on battery size are phev are they good yeah, PHEV. Um, phev i guess from what perspective from a life cycle analysis perspective you have all the complexity of the back the electric system and the um, engine um, and gearbox system into the vehicle so you have a lot of extra unused weight whichever system you're using uh, the range is limited so you do have smaller lighter battery pack but, and it usually will cover most people's commutes i personally i think the cost reduction in battery packs will mean that we'll see a faster adoption of battery electric so for example, if you're going to buy a new car now, you probably would be tempted with a Tesla Model 3 over a plug-in hybrid because of the range, the charging network, the cost of um, operation and things like that. So it, it's the right solution for some people if they, ha if they like to tow, like to drive long distances. Um, but you, if you then do a lot of long distance driving in a PHEV and don't charge it, you might be better off with a different uh, powertrain altogether than a, than a PHEV. So, yeah, I'm, I my personal opinion is I think we'll probably see less PHEVs and more BEVs, but but that might not might not 
be the way that we go. Okay. Um, now, one which is uh, off the vehicle thing. I don't know whether you want to advance a view on this, but this is the question from Daniel uh, Shah. In terms of solar off-grid system design for cellular mass or you know radio yeah. radio mass, which battery technology provides best compromise between cost, capacity, and longevity? So it's a different system we're talking about. Yeah, um, LFP is normally the one that's used. What what we do see though is what we call second life of battery packs. So um, from from vehicles. So whether that's an iPace, a Nissan Leaf, a Tesla, whatever it may be, when when the energy retained in that battery pack isn't really sufficient for for using it as a car, it's dropped down to 80 or 70 percent of the installed capacity, then they can be used in these grid storage applications, uh, set remote cellular masks with, you know, whether it's coupled to renewable wind, solar, whatever it may be. Um, but if you're designing from scratch, LFP tends to be the chemistry that people are going for, unless um, you have a big vested interest in um, a particular chemistry and can scale from, from the automotive and therefore it's a bit cheaper. Okay, another question, different uh, tack this time from JSW. Uh, can the battery condition be monitored? That's the deterioration of battery rather than the state of charge or is it derived from the battery's operating history? So if you're given a battery which you don't know its operating history, can you tell you how good or how bad it is and how it will perform? Yeah, you, you can do. Um, what you typically will look at is the internal uh, resistance measurement of the, of the um, cell, which resistance goes up typically over time, which results in more heat generated in the cell. Um, so as as that as that goes up, your your cell ages. So you don't just infer from its usage what the uh, a state of health of the battery pack is. You you do do some uh, calculation and analysis. You can work it out, but it is uh, it's easier if you have the history as well as that calculation, rather than just trying to uh, provide the calculation. So a lot of the work around Second Life is looking at. Um, having a digital passport for battery pack so you know exactly what's happened to it and then you can appropriately use it in a, a second life. Okay, um, by the way, I've just uh, seen a note that John Wheeler, JSW is John Wheeler, so you've just okay. answered his question, thank you for that. Uh, then there's another question from uh, Barbara Zvolska. Uh, since the batteries are so temperamental in terms of heat and voltage, is there a way to fix power capacity fade? What's the future of that? Oh, um, so the packs are engineered to keep the keep them within their voltage limits, within the temperature limits. So you have a, a thermal system. I talked briefly about the immersion dielectric um, work that we're doing, but you have something that can heat and cool the battery packs to keep it within that nice operating condition. Um, it's really more a case of being efficient with the energy that you need to do that so the less energy that you need to maintain that operating window the, the more efficient the overall vehicle there are i guess advice you get from if you're an electric car owner about how you charge your battery if you leave it at fully charged all the time if you leave it empty when it's cold outside you know there's some, some do's and don'ts and plenty of youtube channels and uh, sort of advice around that Okay. Um, now is that ah? Oh, there are some more. Yes. Uh, da, 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 da. I'll try and some. Oh, I'll, I'll feed this one in here with something a little bit different. We normally like to have meetings at which we can network beforehand, and we we watch Rue and look forward to being able to Rue what we're doing now, and look forward to to uh, being able to do that again. And the, this is a kind of question which might have been asked on the quiet to you, but I'll let you uh, answer it um, fully. Is Ricardo offering placement opportunities for students this year? In particular, are there positions in the electric vehicle sector? So you can answer it specifically, or you can actually answer it more generally. Over to you. Um, 
the specific answer is I don't know, um, <laughs> but I, I would say um, go on go on to the website. There's a contact on there. S send an email through, um, and I can also ask within the sort of HR department as well. But but the honest answer is I don't know. Um, you know when the sort of annual intake of, of placements are sorted and, and, and how that works. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm afraid. Right. Um, next one is a thanks for a very interesting talk uh, from somebody, I uh, can't see the name at the moment. And then from Dan Cooper, you mentioned cobalt is more of an issue than lithium. Is this an environmental economic or availability issue? Um, not so much availability. There's, qu there's quite a bit of cobalt around. It's more, so if you take an economic point of view, it's a volatility of the material. So, and the volatility comes from where it is mined, the source, um, the rate at which it's mined, um, how it's refined through China. So almost all of it is refined in China. So they have good control over the supply of that. Um, the the other part is a legislation and um, working conditions around some of the mining operations in the Congo. So some of them are operated by um, established uh, mining organisations with uh, what we would call normal procedure for, for working, but some of the smaller ones aren't. Um, but many of the, or I would expect all of the electric vehicle manufacturers have uh, their supply chain managed. And yeah, because it's in the media, because it has in the past been a potential problem, you know, people are very hot on making sure that the supply chain is uh, ethical and um, yeah, all of the standards are met uh, within that. But yeah, it has been a challenge in the past, uh, mining in the remote Congo and get, getting control over that supply chain. Okay, uh, right. Uh, then really we're into the, the final wrapping up. Um, but there is there's, there is one question which I'm going to ask David, James or Andrea to, to answer because I've forgotten the, the answer to the question. It's not really a, a, a question to you. It's, it's please say thanks to Julian for this interesting webinar. The, uh, this is a question for the organisers, please. Could you provide a CPD certificate? Certificate. I, I, of course we can, but I can't remember uh, how to do that. David, uh, could, uh, can you remember to do it? Or Andrea, if you're listening, uh, can you to do it? Over to you, David. Um, I believe we can. The mechanism, I don't know, but I will find out and we'll try and let people know. Okay, the, the, that uh, anonymous attendee then uh, should um, perhaps uh, contact one of us and then by that time we'll find out. Uh, Andrea, if you're still there, could you, could you answer the question? Uh, some participants raised hands. Um, is, uh, could you put the answer on the... On the uh, Yes. Okay. I can't. I can't uh, bring in the raised hands on this in this way. Um, right. No. One more question, which has just come in. Um, this is uh, from Martin L. Again, I saw a presentation about two years ago, which suggested that a high proportion of community had plug-in electric cars. That the electricity infrastructure could not cope, particularly local sub substation. Any views on this? Uh, you, you know, when is yeah. it going to be okay? So we, um, as part of a program called uh, My Electric Avenue, which looked at this, so we, uh, I think it gave 200 Nissan Leafs to cluster communities um, to use and plug in on their street. And they uh, man looked at the grid and the substation loading for those. Um, and what it aimed to do was switch the charging uh, on between the charges to share the load on the grid. And what, what you find is people don't know um, what's, uh, that your charging has been interrupted. So you still wake up in the morning with the same amount of charge but you that you wanted, um, but the grid manages to balance itself by uh, monitoring the, the charge 
for each vehicle. So yeah, I'm sure there are sort of local uh, perhaps challenges for some areas. I think what, what I did see, I think this was from um, the national grid saying that we've dropped the, the peak consumption in the UK has dropped over the last 10 years by about four gigawatt hours. Um, and if we all sw switch to electric, it would only go up by about 8% of that 10% drop. So the grid at a national level it is capable. It's just whether there's um, um, yeah problems maybe at, at some small local substation level, but the smart charging technology that you get into people's homes is uh, is really helping. Okay then, right. Thank you very much, Julian. I, I'm just uh, I'm, uh, going to, first of all, uh, say that I, the guy who, the anonymous guy asked for CPD, um, I, I think the best thing is to, is to submit a, a CPD application in the normal way and quote this lecture, and I'm sure you'll uh, get a result if you submit it to the IET. Uh, the, the IET uh, are indeed uh, on this matter very joined up. So anyway, at that point, I'd like to thank you very much indeed, Julian. And there have been lots of nice comments on the lecture. Just make a, 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 a comment from my point of view. Uh, which I, you can either answer or just uh, <laughs> not bother, um, which is, you know, I've been most impressed by the sophistication uh, of w which is being applied to this area and they, you know, the way that the electric cars and vehicles are really improving very fast. I'm also impressed by the way the green targets are almost being met or maybe they're a little bit ambitious, but they're certainly from the figures that you presented heading in the uh, in the right direction. So my question is, and I don't know if you want to, in the electronics, there is Moore's law. Everything improves. <laughs> to, so yeah. what's the Moore's law? Is it one everything doubling every five years or two years or 10 years or what? For electric vehicles. Um, so energy density is the big one. I think we're past the point of doubling every, every so often. So it's perhaps if we talk about vehicle specific so the original bmw i3 launched 2014 maybe something like that had a range of 96 miles the latest vehicle that's launched has a range of 168 miles and that's in the same battery pack space so that's just improvement in the chemistry itself so um I would say that's what more than a sort of 70% improvement, whatever it may be over six years. I think we won't see those big steps, but we are now getting to a point where uh, it's, yeah, we're getting 500 mile electric vehicles being released. And now we'll hopefully start to see this, the cost and the battery pack size reduce. So yeah, I, I don't think unfortunately we'll be doubling every few years, but we're certainly seeing big, big steps uh, coming. Right, well, thank you all. And uh, now I think I just uh, uh, press end and everybody disappears. Thank you all very all much. Right. Thank you very attention. much for your time this evening. Thank you. Yes, much. and uh, I noted that at one stage we had 155 attendants. So thank you all for, uh, for, for joining in tonight and see you next time at the next talk. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.